Okay, here we go. Good evening, everyone. My name is Meredith Vaughn. I'm an official court reporter in Rochester, New York, and I serve as chair elect of the National Court Reporters Foundation and chair of the Ask Me Anything Task Force. We have in attendance tonight um, some of the task force members, including Rich Shermosin and Sandy Nayrup. Um, we also have as a task force member, Early Langley. Um, we have founding member Marjorie Peters and Cindy Isaacson and staff from NCRF, Jill Landsman, who facilitates all the things that NCRF gets done. Um, so why are you here tonight? Ask me anything about how I graduated. The Ask Me Anything series was created by this task force about a year and a half ago, and we've covered topics on ask me about being a court, being a freelance court reporter, ask me anything about what it means to be an official, ask me anything about how I could become a captioner. And so our topic this month is how to get over that hump. How, how do people graduate? How do I get this done? Um, so we have a fabulous group of panelists that are gonna answer questions. Um, just so everybody has for planning purposes, we're gonna spend one hour together tonight. Um, it'll end at nine and we'll get through as many questions and answers as we can in our hour. However, that is not the end of your resources. If for any reason you have more questions, you want to reach out, I'm asking our panelists to share a work email or phone number that they're willing to be contacted at later in the hour when I'm not speaking, I'll put mine in as well. If for any reason you want to have a longer conversation, you want to ask more questions, reach out. We'd be happy to speak with you. Um, so one of the things that we like to do with our Ask Me Anything series is promote it so that people will join next month as well. And part of promoting it is taking a photo. So I'm gonna stop speaking and we're gonna pause and Rich is in charge of our photo. So Karen, not the time to flip your hair. <laughs> what she did for one of our photos and was very silly. Yeah, okay, right. so anyone else wanna put on their camera, lipstick? Yeah. We're gonna take a picture. All right, I'm gonna do two because I see there's two pages. All right, ready, one, two. And let me get the next page. Oh, wow. Okay. All right. Ready? One, two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Um, so I don't want to um, forget to tell you guys this. Um, the next Ask Me Anything um, night is going to be Tuesday, December 3rd. And the topic is going to be Ask Me Anything about fiscal responsibility. Um, we have a great uh, lineup for next year. Uh, events in January, February, and March. We're gonna talk about um, career launcher program, which I'm sure will come up tonight as well. We're gonna talk about what's in your bag. Um, even questions that we got for this evening were um, along the lines of good gadgets, what should I have in my court reporting bag? So mark on your calendar, Tuesday, January 28th is um, the ask me anything about what you should have in your steno bag. Um, so, enough of me talking. I'm going to introduce you to some fabulous panelists. Um, they're going to tell you a little bit about who they are, what they do, um, so you have a little perspective about where their answers are coming from. And I will start with Allie Hall. Hi, good evening. I'm Allie Hall. I'm a court reporter of 26 years and a court reporting instructor of eight years. Happy to be here. Thank you, Allie. Um, Jillian Kirchner. Hi, uh, my name is Jillian. Good to be here. I am a freelance court reporter working um, out of Colorado, but taking California jobs. And this is my third year as a reporter. Outstanding. Angie Podge. Hi, my name is Angie and I live in Kansas City, Missouri, and I have been working for just a little over a year this month. I'd love to see it. Chandler. Hi, everybody. I'm Chandler Alvino. Um, I am an RSR, RPR, and certified in the states of California and Washington. And I'm a freelance stenographer in Ventura, California. And yeah, I've been working for about three years as well. Outstanding. Angelica Brooks. Hi, everyone. I'm Angelica Brooks, working out of Rochester, New York. Um, I am a baby stenographer. I just graduated from Alfred College this year in August. I have about eight depositions under my belt, so I'm new. 
And every perspective is super, super important. Um, I'll just take two seconds to say that um, I've mentored Angelica the last couple of years, and it's been just a fantastic experience. Um, Annie Mueller, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm Annie Mueller. I live in Oklahoma City, and I too am a baby reporter. I just started in July. I trained at the Juvenile Justice Center, and I just moved to the county courthouse in downtown of where I live in Oklahoma County. Standing. Um, next that we have on our panel, Bethany Morse. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, I am uh, I've been out of school and working for about two and a half years now. I'm an RSR. I take jobs in Washington State, Colorado, and South Carolina, where I live, uh, which is Charleston, South Carolina. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, Denise Sanders. Denise Sanders. She's coming. I was talking and nothing was coming out. Uh -oh. uh, I'm I'm a freelance reporter from Houston, Texas. I've been doing it about 32 years. Wonderful. Okay, so obviously you can tell um, our panelists um, are from all over the country. They have different amounts of experience. They have different perspectives. Um, I don't think there's one answer that's the key to any of these questions. And I think it's super important that we get um, a wide variety of answers. Um, so we're going to start with a question, um, how did you graduate? And I just really feel like, you know, the key to the universe, everyone had the answer to this question, you know, our students would be pouring out of our schools. So remember, as you hear the answers, some things are going to click with you, some things are not going to click with you, some things you will have thought of before, some things will have never crossed your mind. So um, whatever your favorite way is to take notes, um, get ready for, a, um, you know, different answers, different perspectives. And we're going to start with Angelica, just because it's only been a couple of weeks since she graduated. And um, Angelica, if you can just, you know, share a little bit of your story about what was happening during court reporting school, that'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. It was definitely a roller coaster. Um, the program at Alfred is only two years, but I did go part-time and I hit some plateaus, um, wicked plateaus that never seem to end. I was at exit seat, exit speeds for over a year. I took a break. I took an entire semester off. Um, but ultimately the key for me, what really clicked everything was, um, changing up my practice and if you keep, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, and you're not getting the results that you need, then you need to change. Um, so I found that actually slowing down, doing, go, getting back to basics, uh, doing finger drills, number drills. Um, I got out my theory book, my drill book from, uh, you know, my first semester and I'm writing Deb had an egg, you know, just stupid stuff like that. Because I, I found for me that the small words really were the hardest part. Um, so when I slowed down, I was actually able to speed up. And then part of it was just, just focusing. Um, if you have a bad practice or you are, um, I don't know, just really struggling at your computer, but you need to get your hours in, you need to get your pages in some, you know, some sort of requirement. I say, slow down, do something for fun and getting out of your own head that that ch just changing my mindset is kind of what helped me get over the the hump i guess without going on for too long about that um that was great next i'm going to turn to angie um for for me i i actually attended three different um, court reporting programs and i switched from my first program when i was actually at 225 and i had to jump bump down in speed at my next school as a requirement. And, um, but so for me, it's just like, you know, sometimes the school you start with isn't the school that might necessarily get you there because of different teaching styles. Um, and then a lot of it is just um, your self motivation. Um, I had a group of people that I would study with. Um, I had a, a silent study buddy, um, Zoom that we did, we met up every morning 
um, before people had to go to work and we would just practice on our own in silence just for that accountability. Um, so just making sure that you are um, putting in the work uh, on your own is really huge because you can't just rely on class time. Um, so yeah, and then um, was it, and did we start with Angelica? Angelica said, slow down to speed up. Um, and then a lot of people also say to push speed. Um, and that's something that, you know, Allie Hall talks about a lot. And uh, she encouraged me to work at faster speeds. And that definitely helped me um, pass speeds at 225. Wonderful. Um, and I am going to turn to Allie next. What helped me get through school? Um, I think tenacity. You have to really not let the failure deter you. Have full control over your headspace and feel the failures, but keep performing and just have faith that it's all going to come together. And I did not have a, an easy go. I was a single parent and I went to school full time and I worked full time and I still got out in 14 months. But it was hard. You know, you had to be disciplined and dedicated and you have to be committed to it and not just interested in it. And I think uh, we're all going to fail. Um, Matt Moss put it very eloquently. I don't remember the exact numbers, but he said to a group of students of mine once, he had to take 100, 1,075 tests to pass 75 tests. Um, so you're going to be failing for the majority of your speed building journey. So get that hurdle out of the way on the front end. There's no way you're just going to push immediate through and not have those failures. I think just having the headspace to pick yourself back up and make yourself want to try again even though you're constantly failing and you feel like you're not getting much traction is really important. Thank you. Um, Jillian, do you have an answer for this one? How did you graduate? Yeah, so I self-studied in theory and then did Simply Steno for speed building. And it was a very like isolating thing, just be at my computer every day by myself working on this. And so I was at a plateau of 170 for about like five months. So it was a while. And just to get out of my own head, I started reaching out to people in my state association to, um, to shadow them. And so even though I like was at 170, 180, I was like getting out there trying to get any way of getting motivated to like push myself to keep working on it. So I think that like getting outside and like meeting other people and seeing what this career could be was really helpful. And then, like Angie said, um, having groups that I would practice with daily, I think both of those combined helped me get there. Very nice. Um, we're going to do one more panelist on this question before we move on, and I'm going to ask Bethany Morse to answer. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody has given such great answers. Um, for me, it was it was a lot about the, you know, practicing really fast um, to kind of trick your brain into believing that 225 is not really that fast. Um, I think believing in myself was was one of the biggest things because you have the skills that you need when you're at those exit speeds and you're practicing and, and all of that. You have the skills that you need to pass. And it's really the mindset and it's not talking to yourself, not putting yourself down in the middle of the test those kinds, that kind of self-talk really tanks you. Um, and it tanks me still to this day. Um, so that's been one thing is the, the mindset is really important for conquering those exit speeds. Um, so that was my experience. Outstanding. Thank you very much for sharing. Um, the whole process of graduating is such a long, complicated, involved um discussion issue, all the things that go into it. But I truly can say that the reason I graduated is because of the brief form for customer. And this is something that happened to me um, several times throughout my career where I learned a new brief form and then it came up on the test and my brain was suddenly happy because it's like, oh, one stroke, I know that one, I can use that one. And that pushed me through the rest of the take because I was so excited that my new brief form was included in this. Um, I work in the court system and literally it don't, I, I'm slow with my brief forms. I'm still working on it 34 years later, but the brief form for police officer was why I passed my civil service exam to come work in the court system. And 
I won't say them all, but I remember them all. That one brief form I had just learned that was on the test that I nailed and was so happy that everything came together. Um, just a little aside story. So sometimes we're not so happy in steno school and sometimes life gets really hard and we get really frustrated. So I'm gonna ask Denise, what do you do? What did you do when you got frustrated and how did you, how did you push through it to graduate? I'm not, I don't know that I'm the right one to answer that question because I don't remember ever being frustrated. I just basically had tenacity. I just practiced. I was extremely, extremely focused. And if I was having trouble with something, I just worked harder at it. So I got through, you know, I got through all the speeds and got through school in a little less than a year and a half. I just don't remember being frustrated. I'm sure I probably was, but it was a long time ago. Okay, hey, great. How about Chandler? Yep, go ahead. I raised my hand because um, I was in a constant state of frustration through school. So <laughs> I feel like I could talk about this forever. Um, I There's a difference between my body's reaction to the frustration and what I had to retrain my brain to deal with the frustration. Um, but my reaction would be to just be devastated. I mean, I would cry all the time. I, my, I could like barely even hear the dictation because I had so much testing anxiety and my heart would just be pounding in my ears. But um, I think that what Ali was saying with the tenacity and just dealing with figuring out how to deal with the failure tolerance and building that up. And that's like the overarching theme of it, but the baby steps that I took to get there you know, I have my dog Cooper, he's my best friend. I would take him for a walk and I would convince myself that he needed it when really I was just on the verge of a mental breakdown and needed it myself. Um, doing things like that and knowing when to step away from the steno machine. Practice is great, I love it when I'm doing good. And when I'm not, I would say, okay, I don't care if I've only been trying for five minutes today, I'm gonna do something for myself. I'm gonna go for the walk, I'm gonna go on the beach. I'm going to talk to my friends. I'm going to cry on the phone with them and, you know, just whatever you need to take care of your mental health, I think is the most important thing. So. I love that answer. Um, Allie, I have a feeling that you get asked this question a lot. I'm so frustrated when your students come to you and say that, what's your advice? Yeah. I mean, you, it seems like the definition of insanity is to keep trying the same thing that's not getting you results. But honestly, that's exactly what you need to do. And it just clicks. I think my best advice is test scores are, are not equal because all tests are not created equal. So if you're doing bad on a test, you know, a lot of students have frustrations. Why am I getting a 94 and then I go down to a 75 and then I go up to an 83? And there's just so much that goes into your ability to focus for the full five minutes that is required during sustained speed testing. So when you're frustrated, do something you enjoy. I agree with that 100%. Um, I, you know, I recommend writing a music set list on your machine. I like to journal on my machine. You can um, do a, an episode of Netflix or a podcast or something that you like. You can listen to an audio book and, and speed it up or slow it down. Those are all really important things. And you know, if you're in the middle of the frustration, take a moment, go do something else. And I tell my students, it's better to have your machine in your lap on the couch and be writing along to a TV show than to not be having your machine at all. And to just recognize those moments where you need to step away for a minute. Thank you very much. Um, Jillian, what did you do when you got frustrated? I'm kind of in the same boat as Denise, where I don't know if I'm the best one to answer this, because I, when I failed the test, it didn't really impact me that much I just I said okay well next test let's go like I think I almost got to a point where it was like all right I'm probably not going to pass this one so let's just do it anyway and let's see how it works and those were obviously the ones where I would somehow pass and so like I know it's easy to say hey like care less but <laughs> yeah, it's not the best advice but yeah if you can do anything to minimize it that's what I would try to do Jalika has her hand raised. <clears throat> You're on mute, Angelica, sorry. Yeah. 
There you I go. Flipped it. Okay. So I was always so frustrated and time management, um, an organization, not my best suit. And so for those of you who might be floundering a little bit, I have my notebook here. This was when I was practicing and I started just writing everything down, how I'm feeling. I would write down like a to-do list and I have my problem words. And I really started mapping out like what I needed to do. And I found that when I gave myself a plan, I, you know, I would enter, okay, I need to practice for three hours. I could practice the entire English language. There's 2 million words in the English language. How, how what am I supposed to do? So I found that really just kind of narrowing the scope um, and working on, me, if it, if it had to be the same dictation for a three hour practice or something, then I, then I did it. And I did my, um, we called it MSBM. I forgot what it stood for, but going through one minute at a time and just working at one minute or my teacher, uh, Danielle green at Alfred, we had the alley hall method and, and, you know, you work at the crazy speeds for five, 10 minutes, and then you go down. Um, but just having a direction to go in, I found really helped me focus and get better. Very nice. Allie, did you know they were copying you or naming things after Copy you? That's you. fantastic. <laughs> no, not at all. That's great. Interesting. You're more famous than you realize. Angie, what did you do when you got frustrated? Um, I don't think I would have finished court reporting school if it wasn't for my really strong mentors and my best steno friends. Um, I was in two different mentoring groups um, and I have two local mentors that um, have really been there for me. And then just the friends. So like whenever things are tough, it's good to have people to turn to who understand the struggle. Um, if it's a mentor, they can help give you advice or maybe you don't even want advice. Maybe you just want someone to just understand what's happening. Um, and I think if it weren't for those people, I don't think I would have finished. Wonderful. Um, so we'll broach the subject of mentors right now. This came up in many people's submission of other things that they wanted to hear about. Um, when do you get a mentor? What speed do you get a mentor? What can they help with? A mentor is good every step of the way. It does not have to be saved for a certain speed. Um, anytime that you need to talk, express your frustrations, like Angie just said, um, there's lots of ways to connect with a mentor. One of them is the virtual mentoring um, program that NCRA runs. So all you have to do is go to ncra.org, our home website, and you can put in the search box in the corner, mentor, and it will bring up um, the um, information, frequently asked questions, the membership sign-up form. So anyone that doesn't like to meet in person, maybe you just wanna text or email, um, you can have a virtual mentor that you meet on a video call, or otherwise. If you are the kind of person that really is looking for that hometown connection, I wanna to go to coffee with someone, reach out to your state association. They also have mentor programs. Um, larger cities have some local associations to reach out to. Um, but after those three places to look for a mentor, I have to say, call your local courthouse, call your freelance firm um, that's near you and say, who you are, what you're doing, do they have anyone that's willing to talk to you? And you will find a lot of people that really wanna to talk to you. Um, I think Angelica is friends with half of my coworkers at this point because everybody loved it when she visited the courthouse and sat in with us. So um, that's what I had to say, add about mentoring. Um, that was ncra.org, mentor in the search box for the virtual mentoring program. All right, we're gonna move on to what was your practice routine and how long would you practice? And before I ask the students um, their answer to this question, I'm gonna ask first Rich Jermosen. Um, he probably didn't know I was gonna do this. He is one of our Ask Me Anything task force members, but also um, the founder of the um, 100 Day Practice Group. So Rich, if you could just explain a little bit. Explain my practice routine in, in, uh, in school? Well, yeah, um, and how that transitioned to afterwards making the 100 day practice group. Well, I know they said do two or three hours and I was doing two hours for the first, I don't know, maybe month or so. And then something kicked in that said, you know, Rich, two is good, but three is probably better. So I started doing three hours and I actually I went to, a you know, a brick and mortar school. Um, we went to school Monday through Thursday. 
uh, 8.30 to 3. So at 3 o'clock, school was over, um, and I would stay in school because there was no distractions there. You know, there's no, you know, whatever's at home. And I would wear a stopwatch, and I would practice from 3 to 6 ish or so. I would try to get three hours, and if I went to the bathroom, I stopped the stopwatch. Um, and then, so I did that for most of the school. When I got to 225, um, I noticed that the CSR was like, I don't know, four months away. And I said, you know, you need to step it up. So I started doing five hours. I do, I would do two hours in the morning at five o'clock. And then I would do my three hours, um, after school. And I figured, you know, if I do five hours for, I don't know, for five months, you know, I'll probably pass that CSR. Uh, that was the hope at least. And that's what happened. Um, so, I mean, what I did, I, I basically just did the speed tapes that we recorded in school. I just, you know, rewrote them. Uh, it was obviously, you know, over 30 years ago, so it was a little different. Um, there wasn't this writing short thing that we have now. Uh, but yeah, that, that was it. Basically, I just said, you know, let me do three hours for the most, for the most, most of my time in school. In the last five or six months, I did five hours a day just to, I wanted to get that first CSR out of the way. You know, I just, if you know if you obviously if you can pass the first time you want to do it so um so i started doing five hours um and then i didn't practice for a long time uh after i got out of school uh you sort of do what what people around you are doing and nobody was practicing that i you know that i noticed at least and i started practicing again i think for the rmr maybe i don't know maybe 10 or 15 years in and then uh, i wanted to do the speed contest so i said well i need that rmr and um so I started practicing. The reason I made the 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 practice page real quick, I'll try to make this quicker. Um, I, I was on my third speed contest, and everybody, you know, in the speed contest would say the same thing year after year. I I did okay, but boy, if I would have practiced a little sooner, if I would have did more practicing, and I said, you know, everybody keeps saying the same thing. So I said, we need a place to report. You know, we need a place, and I just said, I don't know, hundred days. Uh, so you know, report do hundred days, fifteen minutes minimum. And you're probably going to be better after that hundred days, so that's um, that's how the the, the practice page started almost uh, ten years ago last month. So yeah, outstanding. Um, so for all the students out there that think that you know that your practice is going to end when you graduate, um, it actually doesn't. Um, but it it brings you a lot of improvement. Um, Bethany, I'm going to call on you next. Um, what was your practice routine? <laughs> I think at times during my school journey, it was more or less successful. Um, I would say I don't remember the specifics anymore, but um, if there were times that I was unmotivated, it might have only been an hour outside of classes per day. At times when I was really motivated, it might have been six hours per day. Um, so, and that probably contributed a lot to the fact that it took me two and a half years to graduate. Uh, which I regret. Um, and a lot of it is about time management. And uh, I don't remember who said it, but having a plan, uh, I think it was An Angelica, really sitting down and having a plan for what I was going to do in the specific hours that I had allotted for that day. And it's still the same now as a, as a working reporter. I practice every day and I have to balance that with the length. You know, maybe I have a long deposition, maybe I have scoping to do. So it's really about the time management and being intentional about time. Wonderful. Um, Annie, do you have an answer for this one you'd like to share? Yeah, so um, whenever I first started school, what I would do, because I was working at the time, I was actually working mostly through most of my school, but um, I would always try to practice. I would wake up 30 minutes earlier than usual. I'd practice 20 to 30 minutes. During my lunch break, I was fortunate enough that my job would let me practice during my lunch break. So I practice again, 20 to 30 minutes there and then break them up into little sections. So I would have practiced total of 60 to 90 minutes a day because I noticed that if I was practicing more then I would just fry my brain and I'd rather have a quality 60 to 90 minutes versus like a two plus hours where I'm not retaining anything and I'm just wanting to throw my machine across the room. But I always like to start easy and then end easy. I never want to leave my machine really frustrated. Even at the end of a test, whenever I would fail, like, I mean, get like a 20% kind of fail. I mean, I would still like write to music or just something that would make me happy. 
But for the most part, my practice, I mean, finger drills, alphabet, theory, dictation. So that's what got me through school is going, just splitting it into increments versus doing it all at one time. Wonderful. Um, in the chat box, we've um, been asked that Allie answer this question. Yeah, so um, it wasn't easy for me because I, I, I was 20 when I started school and I had a six month old. And I went full time to school Tuesday through Friday from eight to five. And then I worked as a waitress at Red Lobster on Friday nights, a double on Saturday, a double on Sunday and a, an evening shift on Monday. So I didn't have any days off at all while I was in school. And I wish I could say that I was really uh, disciplined and woke up at five and got all my practice in, but I did not. Um, I needed to sleep sometimes. So what I would do, I would go to school and my study hour, I would um, practice and eat a sandwich. So I didn't really take a lunch break. Everyone else was leaving and going to lunch, but I knew that I needed that time to practice. So I would practice during my lunch and just eat a sandwich at school. And then in the evenings, um, as my son got older and he was mobile, which was, you know, it was a lot easier when I could just he was six months old and wasn't crawling yet, and I could get some practice in in the evenings. But once he started crawling and moving around, it was a lot harder. So I would actually just practice through the chaos and all the noise in the living room while he was watching TV. And my parents, I lived with my parents. We both did. So my parents would be there just doing their thing. We would eat dinner. Um, there would usually be like Winnie the Pooh or something on. Um, and I would sit there and practice with my Walkman to the dictation while he was playing and watching TV. And I think that really allowed me to go through speeds without my head overthinking my hands because I was like focused on what he was doing and what was on the television rather than worrying about what my hands were up to. So it just became automatic very early on. And I think that that really helped me a lot. But again, your mindset, it wasn't a matter of when I become a court reporter or if it was like on day one, when she said probably three of you are gonna make it through, I knew one of them was gonna be me. Um, there was never a choice and it was just something I decided I was going to do and I was willing to work as hard as I needed to. But you don't have to have a two hour study session. You can do 30 minutes here, 20 minutes there, and it still adds up. So find your 10 minutes, find your 15 minutes, find your 30 minutes. And I've, I've taught a lot of students that are single parents and very busy and they just managed to squeeze in smaller increments that still added up to a big chunk of practice. Um, I, I love that answer, um, mostly because, you know, there's a lot of life going on there. There's a lot of things going on. And I'm sure that um, many of the people in the audience today can can relate to that, that you, we don't all have the luxury of just doing court reporting school and all the other things that we have to fit in. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on, I do not know how old the study is, but there was a study years ago that proved 21 hours a week of concentrated practice plus full-time school um, would equal a successful graduate. And part of that 21 hours a week, like many of the people have just answered, is fitting it into the time of day that works for you, fitting it into the time of concentration that works for you, fitting it into the increments that work for you. Just because we all need to practice 21 hours a week doesn't mean we have to do it the same way. So really like tweaking your life to figure out um, how that can best happen. Um, so crucial, we're, we're here to talk about how did I graduate? And on top of needing to practice and working with a mentor um, and dealing with our frustration is dealing with our nerves. Um, so I'm gonna call on panelists to ask about, you know, even, even today when you're a working reporter, how do you handle your nerves? Denise, do you have an answer for this one? I have a couple different answers for this one. When I was younger and in school, I just, I didn't really have the nerve so much. I just, I think I was just so incredibly driven. I just wanted out. So I just, I just kept focused and I just knew that if I practiced above the speed of the test, I'd be okay. But then of course that can backfire on you too, which it did to me, it backfired on me the first time. I, I wanted it so bad that all of a sudden I couldn't find the keys with two hands and a flashlight. So that was really fun. Yeah, I knew the minute I walked out of that first time, I. I didn't pass it. I knew it. So the second time I just went in and I was writing 260 words a minute and I flew through it, passed it. No big deal. Now, fast forward 20 years, give or take, I'm terrible in math. I wanted to take the RMR 
or the CRR. Well, by then, you know, you're older and things change. So I just took a shot. I just took a shot before the test, studied my hands out and I was good. Passed both the first time. So, you know, it's whatever works for you. Some people take beta blockers. Um, I have a friend that took beta blockers. I just took a shot, worked like a charm, steadied my hands out and I was good. But you know, the key, the key to all these nerves things is, is, is being confident that you've practiced enough and that you're ready. I think three quarters of that is just being ready, just, you know, knowing that you're ready and not just there's, I've seen too many attitudes with some of the students of, well, I'm just going to, I just need to pass that test. I just need to get that one last little 225. It doesn't matter if they have what 45 errors. They just, they only care about, they only care about barely passing. And this is not a job about barely passing. I mean, it's just not, you can say that all you want, but when reality strikes, you got to be able to write when you get out in the real world. You know, so being prepared is, I'd say, three quarters of it. And if you've got that confidence, you're not going to be that as nervous as if you're like, well, you know, I just barely got there. I just barely made it. And yeah, but I'm going to do it anyways. Attitude. So that's just my take on that. Excellent. I was just nervous in general. When I took the RMR, I was just nervous. I mean, I hadn't tested in, I hadn't tested since, God, I got out of court point school. I was like, what the hell? Yeah, that's my story. And I'm sticking Thank to it. Thank you. Chandler. So I started testing for the RPR while I was still in school and probably way before I was ready. But my reasoning was I wasn't trying to skim by, um, but I was trying to just desensitize myself to it because I needed to know exactly what to expect. Um, that was my way of dealing with my nerves or one of the ways. Um, and the irony in me being a panelist on how did you graduate school is that I didn't graduate. I never passed a 225 test in school. I passed my RPR before I ever passed one in school. So um, I think it's important that if you feel like you're the type of person like me who needs to try something, maybe dip your toe in and like figure out what it's all about before you fully dive in, um, then do it. Uh, also, I I did do beta blockers and I also did hypnosis and hypnosis was, I think, the most important thing in me passing tests. Um, it didn't add much more to my practice or um, anything. It didn't add any time to my day, really. Sorry, I haven't talked all day. I was in a deposition. <laughs> I'm like just using my vocal cords for the first time today. Um, so, but anyways, for hypnosis, it was just audio tapes that I would listen to as I was falling asleep. There was no extra effort on my part. And I found that it was extremely calming and that's what really pushed me over the edge and allowed me to pass all these tests, so. Great, um, so I'm gonna ask you to explain the beta blockers because maybe I'm just old and naive. I have not heard of that. So beta blockers, um, I went to my doctor and I basically said, I have extreme performance anxiety. And they asked me some more questions about it. And I said, you know, I've got testing anxiety. They're like, well, just study more. I'm like, well, that's not really how this works. Um, so once I explained it more, they recommended beta blockers, which it essentially turns off part of what this sounds intense. Sorry, I don't know how to <laughs> make it sound uh, eloquent. No, but. It's okay. I didn't need a medical, you know, yeah, it, but, it, but that's it general. basically relaxes you without fully defocusing your brain. It, it hopefully gets rid of that edge of the anxiety to be able to still perform without um, feeling the nerves. It's an oral medication. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate the, the help no with that because I didn't know what yeah. was going on. Um, Bethany, do you have an answer? What did you do to deal with your nerves? I have tried it all. Um, I have used beta blockers, um, which they do, I believe some of what they do is I think they slightly decrease your blood pressure. They slightly decrease your, your heart rate. Um, under direction of a doctor, they can be very effective at, um, for me, like they reduced the shakiness in my hands, they reduced the pounding of my heart. Um, so those were effective. I have tried hypnosis in the past, but I might be one of those people that doesn't really believe in hypnosis, which means that it doesn't work for you. Um, 
And I think that anything that you can do to rewire your neural connections to believe in yourself. Um, so I'm a firm believer in uh, positive affirmations and writing down a list and reading those to yourself every day. Um, and just using all of those tools in your toolbox to change, yeah, the mental side of it. And that, in addition to being prepared and practicing for the test, knowing that you can do it, knowing that you can pass, mm -hmm. will help you pass. Um, so there's a follow-up question in our chat box talking about, has any, does anyone still use beta blockers as a working reporter? So I, I can't call on names for this one, but does, is anyone using them as a working reporter? I can say that I did use them. Um, I had a, a really big deposition with about 40 attorneys, first ever, over 20, um, and I used a beta blocker and it, it went really well. Um, so that yeah. was a success story. <laughs> Wow. Um, Angie, do you want to answer what you did to deal with your nerves? Um, Chandler took the words right out of my mouth um, when she said that she started taking like the RPR maybe before she was totally ready. I would take the RPR maybe right after I had passed those speeds in school. And I'm really glad that I did because um, I mean, even though it does cost money, but I was still thinking, you know, maybe I had a chance, but I just really wanted to just try it out. Um, the first few times I messed up the instructions, so I'm glad I wasn't here being like, I should pass this test today. Um, and then my hands shook like crazy the first few times I did it. So the more that you put yourself in that environment, the more you're able to get your nerves under control. Um, I think also it's good to have like a distraction. Um, I passed a test one time um, for the RPR and it was after I had just gotten in a fight with my sister that morning. And I was so mad um, that I was not thinking about the test at all. And I was just like, I cannot believe as I'm writing, I'm like, I cannot believe that she would do this to me on the day of my test. Um, and then I think I got a 98% on that test. Um, let's see, I wrote something down. Oh, and then I just don't really practice a lot on the day of a big test that I'm trying to pass um, because I just, you know, you're not really going to get any better in that one day of practice. And then if you're not having a really great practice, then I mean, for me personally, I would just psych myself out. So I try to do, I mean, I will try to warm up a little bit, but nothing crazy. Um, and yeah, that's what I have for NERPS. That's great. Um, I liked all of that. Um, so, a few times in um, the questions that were submitted, people talked about, um, did you pass on the first time? And, you know, I get so nervous and, um, you know, how, how likely is it to pass your certification on the first test? Clearly we have people in our um, panel that just took it for practice. Um, so that's not doing it in one time. It's not necessary to do it in one time. I've, I've been a reporter 34 years. Back in the day, we had to pass all three legs in the same take. And today you have the luxury, you can take one, one leg at a time, um, separate from your written. We had to do it all in the same day. And I have no shame in telling you that I took the RPR exam 13 times, 13 times. I would write it on my stupid manual machine, type it from my notes. And the first time that I passed the RPR, or when I passed the RPR, was the first time um, they took the computer to type the test to the machine, to the, to the test, to type them. I'm saying that backwards. You know what I mean? It took a long time. Um, when you get your certifications and you continue to get better, you're there and you're improving yourself and there's no shame in you know, taking it more than once. Um, I don't think that you should in any way think that, you know, you're not doing the right thing if you can't pass it the first time is kind of the point of my story. Um, and then I have two other really short things I wanna share. Um, that pissed me off thing is a true emotion because I literally had my court reporter instructor tell me, you're gonna fail, you can't do this. You know, 80% of the people drop out. You're gonna be one of the 80%. I just don't see this in you. And I was livid, like, how dare you tell me there's something I can't do? And I, to this day, want to know the answer to the question, did she say that to me to inspire me? 
or did she say that to me because she believed it was true? And I've always sided with, I think she thought it was true that I wasn't going to make it. And ever since I graduated, I've wanted to send her my paycheck. Like every time I get it, like couldn't do it. Ha ha. Look what I did. Um, and then when you're really nervous, practice, school, test, working reporter, certification exam, having a mantra. Um, and so my personal mantra is, um, it's just words. Like we, we make it into this big thing and it has, you know, all these, comp all these um, serious consequences. And I, you know, I got to make a good record. I got to pass. I got to get all these things done. When you boil it all down, it's just words. It's just words, write the words. It's just words. And if you can say that to yourself so that you're not so, you know, scared of your test, just let, let's just write the words today. Um, so sometimes that works. Um, okay, so we're gonna move on to the question for our panelists. What is your top piece of advice? And I'm gonna call on all of you for this one. Um, I'll start with Allie. Uh, do not let the fear, the fear of failing stop you from testing. Um, so many students pull back from testing because they're scared of failing. The reality is you're going to fail over and over again. So you are inhibiting yourself from progressing because you're choosing not to test. So you need to do the tests even though you're going to fail them. Get it in your head. I'm going to fail these tests and I'm going to keep failing them until I'm good enough to pass one. And then I'm going to immediately start failing them again. And you're going to repeat that same schedule over and over till you graduate. The worst mistake you can make when you're in court reporting school is not testing. And if you're choosing not to test or you're only taking tests that are comfortable for you, it's the same as flushing your money down the toilet because you can't go anywhere. Um, if you're not testing, you're never going to graduate. You're never going to get certified. You're never going to be able to start working. So you really do have to embrace the failure. And I think one of the reason, the, the main reason we struggle so much is because we're all type A personalities that are drawn to this field. So we want everything to be perfect and we're very detail oriented and we're not used to failing and it's uncomfortable and nobody likes to do things when you're constantly failing, but that's the only way you're gonna grow. So look at each test as an opportunity to learn something instead of an opportunity to pass and force yourself to do the minimum requirement for tests for whatever program you're enrolled in. It's the only way you're gonna get results. Outstanding advice. Um, Jillian, what's your top piece of advice? Kind of going on what Bethany was saying earlier about, like, you know, when you're at good speeds that you are fast enough, your hands are fast enough, and it becomes more of a mentality. I, yeah, it's kind of backwards from the practice fast advice that everyone gives, but I would always practice or like have a set of tests I would do on speed or plus 3% or minus 3%. And like, that's where I love practicing because it's like training my brain to feel like I can win, right? Like I can do this, I can pass it. And so, because on the day of a test, there's a bunch of variables, you don't know what the test is gonna be like, if it's gonna be hard for you. I would like minimize that as much as possible and just do the test that I like to do, practice that one test on the day of, and not over practice, but just a little bit. And yeah, that's what really helped me overcome the, the fear like knowing that you have an easy win, you can do that day. I, I would um, summarize that as you did the thing that made you happy when you were writing and it gave you confidence. Um, yeah. And I really, really like those two things. Um, Angie, what's your top piece of advice? Um, I mean, pretty simple. I guess it's just believe in yourself. Um, if you don't pass a test, try not to tell yourself that you failed, which I know is really, 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 really hard. Um, but maybe try to frame it as I didn't pass this time, um, just to try to get that like negative, like feeling oh, uh, to make it go away. <laughs> Sorry, words aren't working today. Um, but yeah, I just like whenever I'm not feeling really good or whenever a friend's not feeling really good and I'm trying to cheer them up, I just tell them that, you know, just believe that even if you don't pass this time, that eventually if you keep going, it will eventually happen. Um, like I'm one leg away from passing the RPR and it's very, very frustrating, but that's something that I have to tell myself all the time is like, okay, it didn't happen this time, but it's going to happen. Like, I believe it is going to happen. Um, and so just 
really just believe in yourself. Hopefully your magic brief will be in the next one. Um, Chandler, what is your top piece of advice? Um, so what really changed for me in school was the time before I, I have it separated in my mind of the time before I reached out and started utilizing this community of stenographers that we have and after because before that I was so isolated, you know, I did all of my schooling online. Um, I didn't feel like my experience was what anyone else was going through. I didn't feel like it was relatable. Um, but the second that I started reaching out to people and felt confident enough to share my experiences, you know, as you were saying, you had failed the RPR. I failed the RPR many, many times, 21 times to be exact. So I, I thought that I was the only one that this had happened to, but then I start talking to people about it and they're like, oh, me too, you know? Um, so I think finding mentors, finding people that you can just relate to and also people who maybe aren't thinking the same way as you. I know I'm preaching to the choir with people here because you're all looking for these resources and utilizing it. But um, I think just taking bits of information from each person that you speak to, even if it's not exactly the style that you would do, um, just take a little bit from everyone, try everything and something will eventually stick and work for you. Great. Angelica, what's your top piece of advice? Um, I found that when I was really struggling, I was reaching out to people and I really wanted someone to just tell me, okay, step one, step two, step three, and then you'll pass. But that never happens because every single one of us on here is different. Um, but I, what honestly really helped me was getting my time management under control and making a plan. And, um, just, I guess, controlling the chaos in the other aspects of my life just kind of helped me be a little bit, feel a little bit better at the computer. I'm not thinking about all the chores I need to do or something like that. Um, and I, I'm a big picture thinker. So like I said before, you know, there's 2 million words in the English language. Where do you even start? Um, so I think just having a plan, writing down your problem words, um, maybe, making up your briefs, but don't make up too many briefs at once. I do that all the time. I'll come up with like 8,000 briefs in one day. And then all of a sudden I'm hesitating on a test. Like, what did I even think of? Like if it, if, if writing it out takes less time than trying to remember a stupid little brief that you like, just write it out and just keep going. Um, and I found that I would just focus too much on little things. And everyone's talking about passing their RPR and their CSR. I never, I never took that test. And I remember sitting down and I would say, I can't even pass school. I'm never going to pass these freaking tests. And once I kind of like allowed myself to melt that away, I'm, I do plan on getting my certifications, but I allowed myself to say like, okay, not right now. Let me just, let me just focus on school right now. And all of a sudden it just got a little bit easier. So as someone who doesn't have their certification right now, I I'm working, I'm freelance, I'm, I'm getting it. Um, but I'm not giving up on my goals, but, but kind of giving up that one little anxiety helped me move past the, the first hump instead of thinking about all the humps after that one, just focus on what's in front of you. So I would say that's what helped me the most. Very nice. Thank you for sharing. Annie, what did you do? Is it okay if I give two pieces of advice? Of course. Okay, one, networking. That is what got me through school and even in life, regardless if it's court reporting or not, networking, knowing the right people, asking all the questions, that is what, I mean, it is, still is getting me through. I'm a new reporter. I'm constantly asking questions. I'm still constantly networking with people. And if I didn't meet people, if I didn't go to conventions, I probably wouldn't even be a court reporter. But my main one is the comparison is the thief of joy. Do not compare yourself to anybody. I mean, I have a fantastic teacher, had a fantastic teacher. I'm not in school anymore, who graduated in 15 months. I had classmates that were graduating so fast and then people were at speeds behind me. And then all of a sudden they were jumping ahead of me. And I'm just like, 
oh my, like I would just always compare myself. So I had to take like a mental break, get off social media. And honestly, it's not when, or it's not if you graduate, it's when you graduate. And a court reporter told me, and that I'll always remember this, that on your certificate, uh, whenever you graduate, whenever you get your RPR, CSR, it's not going to say how many times you took it, how long it took you. All that matters is that you have it. So I guess those, oh, and also give yourself grace. That's something I also learned. I love it. Uh, Bethany, what's your piece of advice? Everyone has such great pieces of advice. <laughs> um, I think for me, I, I identify a lot with um, with Allie. Uh, I did not start court reporting school when I was young. I think I was uh, 30. It was a third career for me. Um, but I knew that it was what I wanted to do. And I knew that I loved it. And I did not give myself a choice. I knew that come hell or high water, I was going to be a court reporter. And that really, that not giving myself a choice to fail really got me through all the days of frustration. It got me through all the, the sadness and, and anger of failing tests. It got me through the redundancy of practicing hour after hour and feeling like I'm not improving. Um, and it's gotten me through, you know, 20 plus times of trying the RPR, that fourth leg that I just can't seem to get, you know, but what's important is that you believe in yourself and you don't give yourself a choice to fail. Excellent. Um, Denise. I don't think anybody's going to like my advice. <laughs> my, I mean, when I, when I was, when I was getting ready for all these tests and stuff, I didn't have social media. I didn't have networking. All I had was myself. You know, and all I did was practice. I just practiced. And when I was in court reporting school, I didn't take, I did the complete opposite of what I'm hearing here. I didn't take a test until I felt like I was ready to take it. You know, I, and then when I was ready, I took it. Most of the time I passed it, you know, and then I moved on and I just, I got I practiced. I felt ready. I took it. I passed it or I didn't pass it. I moved on. But I mean, I just think the bottom line is, is just practice. I mean, just, you know, change up your practice, do your practice. I know I said this before, but just be prepared. I mean, if you're prepared, you're confident and you'll do it. And if you get on a plateau, I think I got stuck. I'm trying to think where I got stuck. I think I got stuck at 160 along with everybody else on the planet. And I just, I just upped my practice for that period of time, you know, but it was hard too, because I went to school full time and I worked full time, you know, so that was tough, but I did it. And I just, you know, I can't, I just, I wasn't one of those people that oh, you know, poor me, I didn't pass the test. It was more like, okay, damn it. So I practiced some more and I took it again. I didn't, I just didn't allow my, it just feeling like that just never came into my, my persona in my life. It just never did. It was just, okay, I passed it, move on. I didn't pass it, practice, take it again, practice, move on. So like I said, nobody's going to like my advice. <laughs> um, except that we're all different people in the audience. And so your advice fits someone in our audience just perfect. Um, you know, it doesn't have to, to be the majority. Um, we need all the perspectives. Mm -hmm. So we're down to our last two minutes and I'm gonna be wrapping it up. I just wanted to mention that a lot of the questions in um, that got submitted from the panelists or the participants tonight were about how do I transition? What's it like to be a working reporter? Um, what do I do with work-life balance, um, a bunch of things like that. So for one, having a mentor, and we already talked about that, is one way to ask those questions, reach out to somebody that shared an email tonight um, to get those answers. But secondly is NCRF's Career Launcher Program. And so that is gap training. What happens between school and work? What do I, I have my... Um, graduation certificate, diploma, I'm going to start working now. Good Lord, what don't I know? How do I do this? So um, you can read about what Career Launcher is on the NCRF website. Um, you can, I don't know where you are in your school program, but many of you are going to have lots of time between when you transition. So the um, March session of Ask Me Anything is going to be about what is Career Launcher? How does it work? Um, so you could put that on your calendar as well. But definitely to make the most of your services that are offered through your membership, um, NCRA, NCRF have a lot of tools out there. So keep reaching out. Um, 
who said it. Somebody said networking is what got them through. And I was just wondering, Annie did, um, did anyone attend the Ask Me Anything about not the power of networking? Um, that was a session that we did earlier this year. Um, so our Ask Me Anything sessions are taped and they come up on YouTube. Um, it takes a little while for them to process, but if you're looking for a past one that you would like to listen to, you can find it on YouTube. Um, so in closing, I just have two more things. Um, we've had some most horrendous um, hurricanes that have come through and affected a lot of our membership. And NCRF um, does um, facilitate the national, not national, yeah, Natural Disaster Relief Fund. So anyone that's interested in donating to that, you can text relief help to 41444. I know not everybody's in position to donate, but um, every little bit helps. And I did want to share that that was still going on. And then um, a way to get a, new, a free student membership at NCRA, like we're coming to the end of the year, you need to renew for next year. Um, students can do two oral histories, either on the Veterans History Project or Legal Aid History. Um, and you can get your student membership for free after you submit those two. So um, the information is available also on the NCRA website. Um, that that mm, I had the title of it. Jill, help me. <laughs> it's ncra.org slash foundation. And uh, or you can do student met look at the student membership page also. If you uh, put student membership in the search bar on ncra.org, you'll find it. And uh, anybody who wants to email me directly at jlandsman at ncra.org, I can guide you to do this. You submit two transcriptions for oral histories that you did on from a video, and NCRF pays for your membership. It's not like there's a complimentary thing going on. We actually do pay NCRA for that. Um, outstanding. So I just wanted to make sure that everybody um, had that information. Um, always trying to save people money. Uh, don't forget, um, December session is about fiscal responsibility. So please come back and see us. Please tell your friends how much fun this was. Um, please join me in thanking our panelists for answering our questions tonight. Um, it was a joy to spend this hour with you. Um, I wish you all the best. Please reach out and we'll see you next time. Good night.